Um, okay, can you all hear me? Yes, sir. I, I hope I haven't put myself on mute or anything. Okay, fine. So uh, we'll start with uh, VA22. I think you received VA22 vocabulary. So I think we'll start with that uh, worksheet. And uh, so, okay. So there are, uh, you please start with set one. There are 10 questions and they're all uh, idioms. You can try to make, in, uh, in case you don't know an idiom, you can try to make an intelligent guess. And uh, after five minutes, we'll start discussing. So it's now 5.10. So at 5.15, we'll start discussing the first 10 questions. So if you can't, if you can't answer it, it's okay. It's like general knowledge, right? So vocabulary is like general knowledge. So in case you don't know anything or if you are not able to make an intelligent guess, it's okay. Uh, just mark it down and uh, we can proceed. Okay, so please start with the, the first 10 questions in your worksheet. And then we'll discuss the first 10 questions and then we'll move on to the next set. And I hope you all have uh, started a small notebook or something where you collect words. Because if you don't know, if you don't do that, there won't be any growth. You'll always be at uh, step zero. Um, Viva. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, uh, we're doing set one, Viva. We'll, st okay. we'll stop at uh, five fifteen. Okay. Okay. Uh, sir, have you sent this? Uh, I think it's sent to you by email. If you haven't, please send me your uh, please send your email to me in in your chat box, and I'll send it to you now. Okay, sir. Uh, please see if you've received it. I think you should have received yes, it. Excuse me, sir. I, I am here. Could you also do the same if I were to send you my um, email? Yes, yes, please. If, if you haven't received the worksheet, please uh, 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 send me your email ID uh, right now and then I'll, uh, yeah. I'll email you. Please do that. Yeah, sure, sir. Sure, sir. I am going to check your email. Yes, sir. I'll check that as well. If you check your email, you will have to email ID. My system is wrong. Uh, yeah, sir, I've got it. Only set one, right? No, you must have got VA26 and uh, no. VA22 and VA36. Yeah. 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 That is what is required for today's session. Okay. How about how about Viba? Yeah. Yes, I have received it. Okay, fine. So it's now 5.13. Uh, we'll stop at 5.17. Uh, so please go through the first set. Set one questions all alone. And we'll discuss them after you finish them. There are 10 questions here. Please go for the 10 questions and then we'll uh, discuss the 10 questions. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you.
Uh, Anikev, I think you've uh, joined now. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I think you received VA22 and VA36 by email. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, so please start with set one of VA22. VA22. VA22 is uh, vocabulary, so please start with the first mm -hmm. set uh, of VA22. Okay. And just try to go through the questions, and I think in about two minutes or three minutes, uh, I think we'll start discussing those questions. Okay, uh, I think we'll start with the first question. Uh, okay, a rift in the in the loot. A rift means uh, see a loot is, as you probably know, it's a kind of a string instrument. It's a musical instrument. A rift means a crack, a very small crack. So a rift in the loot. What does it mean? Even though the lute is such a sophisticated instrument, even a small uh, rift in it can kind of render it useless, right? So if it's got even a small crack, the lute is, is completely useless. So what a, a rift in the lute means is uh, uh, a small mistake, yes, but not, in a, not just in musical compositions, yeah, I think a weak part in an otherwise robust system. I think that should be the most uh, suitable answer. It's uh, so a rift means a crack, a very small airline crack. So, so what the statement means is that even in a robust system like a loot, uh, if there is a small rift, the whole loot will be rendered useless. You know, Sir? there is yeah. So what does the robot system mean? Robust means uh, uh, very sturdy. Very sturdy. Uh, I'll just write that down. Thank you for asking. Robust is uh, very sturdy. Very sturdy and, uh, uh, you know, uh, perfect kind of a system. Perfect, smooth kind of a system. Okay. So, yeah, I think you can rule B out. A fight between two musicians, a blemish. What does blemish mean? A blemish is, uh, is uh, a mark that spoils the beauty of something. Okay, so that's what blemish means. So please make a note of it. Please start maintaining a notebook or a notepad or, or something where you start collecting words because I think that you really do need a, a good vocabulary for your CLAT examination. To cut no eyes with someone. Okay, so to cut no eyes means not up to the mark. Okay, so if you say, uh, don't give me that excuse, it cuts no eyes with me. It means that it is uh, not up to the mark. It is unsatisfactory. Okay, so uh, if you say, uh, uh, please show me your 
notebook where you start uh, where you collect words and if you say uh, i can't because i don't have a notebook then i can say uh, please don't give me that excuse it cuts no ice with me okay so unsatisfactory i think that's what uh, the word means hook line and sinker any guesses pretentious pretentious okay pretentious means uh, 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 false false uh, not natural or pretending be, or it could be even crooked or something crooked okay fine uh, okay hook line and sinker is a phrase that has been uh, sort of uh, adopted from the fishing activity you know so when you have a fish you have a rod and then you have a hook and then you have a line the line is the the rope or the fin thread and sinker is uh, a kind of a a kind of a rubber or a plastic uh, thing that floats on water so hook line and sinker means the fish has swallowed the whole thing it swallowed the hook the hook is what the fish sort of gets uh, hooked up to the line is the whole thread and sinker is the the rubber or a float the rubber or plastic float so hook line and sinker means completely so it, uh, like i said it's uh, kind of borrowed from the fishing uh, sport and this means that the fish has swallowed the whole thing it swallowed the hook it swallowed the line and it swallowed the sinker so hook line and sinker means completely so you can say that i uh, i was defeated hook line and sinker it means completely okay give one of flea in the ear any guess so would that be to irritate someone or to no, tease to, to irritate someone no. to irritate to irritate someone better. to give someone a reproof yeah i think between b and c i think the answer is b to give someone a reproof what does reproof mean reproof means to uh, reproof is to uh, scold someone or uh, reproof is uh, scold blaming someone very good yes to blame someone or to scold someone something like that so that's what uh, give one a flea in the ear mean uh, okay so to be out of to be out on one's ear it means to get fired okay if you say someone is out on uh, his or her ear it means that uh, it literally means somebody uh, held you by the ear and threw you out of the door uh, so can you give me one more idiom to get the sack to get the sack or to get the boot to get the boot to get the boot they all mean to be fired so to be out on one's ear i'll just put that in bold so that yeah so to be out on one's ear is to get fired okay so you can say to be out on your ear so one here is a pronoun right you can replace that that pronoun by any other pronoun so to be out on your ear if you don't behave properly you will be out on your ear what does that mean if you don't behave properly you will get fired okay now turn the table on someone uh c to c. reverse the situation. so c very good to reverse a situation to your advantage you could think of it as a game of chess somebody else is winning and then you turn the table and you start winning okay so uh okay so next question so to make a flag pole out of a matchstick to exaggerate very good to exaggerate i think that's that's uh, sort of uh, self explanatory how about to take time by the forelock see uh, uh, okay it actually means uh, make hay by the sunshine to take uh, to take time by the forelock uh, literally means that uh, f- what does forelock mean uh, you, you may have heard of side lock you know side lock is uh, the the hair that you have uh, you know beside your ear beside your ears you know so side lock is a uh, the hair that you have exactly above your forelock go ahead so that's called side uh, forelock side lock is i think side burn i think most of you may be familiar with side burn but uh, i think side lock and side burn are the same thing but forelock means um, 
we had on uh, on the top of your hair but it generally means the hair uh, on the top of a horse's head head so what this expression means is uh, to to uh, to make the to make the most of to, uh, to 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 make the most of the time that is given to you so it kind of means to make hay while the sun shines so at least the rest uh, are not very suitable so to make the most of the time that is given to you to make the most of the opportunity that is given to you so that's what the expression means so uh, so it basically means utilizing time right not just utilizing time so to take time by the forelock is to make the most of the opportunity that is given okay. so uh yeah to make the most it's not just being careful with time so that so i think between a and d then you have a very close contestion but i think uh, to take time by the four, okay fine i think we just mark this because it's slightly tricky we'll mark it and we'll come back to it i think when you do the next uh, set i think i'll uh, i think we'll uh, i'll give you more uh, material on that we'll just mark it i think that deserves more time we'll move on to nine razzle up something do something in a haphazard way very good uh, to razzle up something is to do something in a haphazard uh, haphazard hazard way haphazard way for example you could say that uh, i was late yesterday so i had to razzle up uh, a powerpoint presentation before i got to work so razzle up is to do something in very short time with very little effort okay in a very haphazard way very good okay uh, to turn the knife i think that's uh, slightly uh, straight forward to to, to make it was to exacerbate to exacerbate yes, to exacerbate right. is uh, to make something worse so to turn the knife means you stab someone and stabbing them itself is a very uh, painful and very wrongful activity and apart from stabbing uh, stabbing them you also turn the knife so you make it even worse okay so that's what the expression means so very good i think uh, you, you are pretty good so i think we'll move on to set 2 yeah so exacerbate uh, exacerbate means to turn something yeah. worse yeah to exacerbate is uh, exacerbate is to make a Sorry. bad yeah to make to make a bad situation worse to make a uh, so could you explain what 7d means uh, i'm sorry could you explain what 7d means 7d uh, d d let me to, okay yeah good to expiate yeah thank you okay uh, i'm sorry i i i, I should have uh, sort of gone through all of that thank you for asking so to expiate is to beg someone to forgive you is to uh, beg for pardon or to beg for forgiveness um you could say that the the prisoner uh, or the convict expiated uh, for his crime or something like that to expiate for something is to beg for forgiveness and to extricate is uh, to uh, sort of uh, not be a part of something to free yourself from something to free yourself to free from something okay uh, you you may have heard of the word inextricable okay inextricable means uh, that which uh, two things that cannot be separated okay inextricable for example you could say that uh, sorrow and joy are inextricable which means they cannot be separated thank you for asking they yeah cannot be separated okay so right we'll just mark that for now and okay so we'll come back to take time by the four lock I'll, i'll see if i can give you uh, more material and by i, I think you can start uh, with set 2 it's now 5:30 we'll uh, start by uh, maybe 5:35 or something 5:37 maybe take 7 minutes there are just five five questions so and i think they're quite straight forward too
sir, only uh, set two questions, sir. Yes, set two. Uh, are you done? Yes, sir, last question. Okay, yeah. you can take your time. Okay, so do we start now? Um, does somebody need more time? No, sir. So we can start. Okay, uh, can you see the screen now? Yes, sir. Uh, it's a different screen. Are you able to see it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, uh, there's a horse here. See, that's called a forelock. So they have that, right? That's called the forelock. So the theory is that only when the horse is running towards you, you can grab the forelock. If the horse is running away from you, 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 you can't grab the forelock. So when you say uh, to take time by the forelock means to take it when it comes to you, when it is running, uh, when it is coming towards you. If it's moving from you, you can't do anything about it. So it's something like to make the most of uh, to make the most of it while it is coming towards you while it is uh, sort of uh, working for you so that's a uh, theory so th that's that's what they say they say that uh, i'll just go back and i'll see see so, so it's basically uh, make hay while the sun shine yeah so because that's the, the option yeah see they say the take time by the forelock to act decisively to accept an opportunity without hesitation. See, if time is pictured with just a forelock of hair, then it can be only grabbed as it comes towards you, not as it leaves you, right? So that's the uh, idea. So now we'll uh, go back to today's, uh, that today's session. Okay, so how about question 11? Uh, a, uh, C. Okay, Please. calling, see, calling a. has, okay. Calling has two meanings. One is you could say that 
uh, you could say something like uh, I had a calling for the arts, which means I had a passion for the arts, or I had a and one more meaning of calling is uh, vocation or a job. Yeah. You could say that uh, 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 at Bangalore, my calling was a and a teacher. So calling can also mean vocation. It's very rare, but not usually used. Normally, calling means. Uh, it either means uh, calling, as in calling someone, or it means calling could mean uh, a passion, like a calling for uh, mathematics or a calling for physics. Snout means mouth, right? So in this case, more. More also means mouth. More could be uh, a verb as well. More as a verb means uh, to eat something in a voracious way, in a hungry way. Haste is a rad word haste means to steal and lob means to throw uh, especially throw in the arc you could say that i lobbed the volleyball over the fence right so lob is not just throw but to throw in a in a um in a kind of a pendulum like way or in a in a trajectile okay that's what lob means so one is c uh, two is B, so we're looking for yeah. Two is B, three is D, and four is A. So I think that's the right answer. Very good. Okay, so we'll now move on to the next question. Question number twelve. Uh, yeah, what's the answer for that? C, 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 so C. C. Okay, we have C again. Let's see. Um, I feel it's B for the twelfth okay. one. The whole answer. Okay. Okay. Oh, very good. Yeah, even I think it's B. Okay, so we have B and C. We'll just see. Okay, rad again is a is a rad word, uh, and frazzle is a rad word. Jumpy is quite easy. Jumpy means somebody who keeps jumping. So somebody who's uh, uh, kind edgy. of anxious, anxious, right? But here, edgy is uh, again not a very common word. But edgy uh, and anxious, uh, jumpy, they both mean someone who's anxious or uh, worried. Uh, something like that, right? Worried or uh, something like that. Okay, so very good. So, so that's the answer for edgy. Dumpy is not a very, it means plump. Someone who's dumpy, short and plump, right? So I can say that. Okay, so frazzle, frazzle doesn't sound like bundle. Right? So is it exhaustion then? Yeah, when you say somebody is in a frazzle, it means that they are in a state of exhaustion. So to, to be in a state of frazzle, it to be in a state of exhaustion. So it has to be that. So wad could mean uh, a bundle. You could say, uh, please give me a wad of... Uh, see, uh, the origin of the word is a wad of tobacco. When you say a wad of tobacco, it means a bundle of tobacco. Because in the olden times, they would smoke tobacco in a pipe, not in, not, not in the form of... Uh, uh, rolled cigarette. So, so wad, that is the origin of the expression. So, wad means bundle. So, very good. So, I think that the answer we are looking for is uh, so one is D. So, it's D A uh, D A C B D A C B. It will be B. Okay. D A C B. Yeah. So, that's the answer. Very good. So you have to make guesses. There's no other way. Yeah, how about 13? A, sir. A, okay. Zany means mad. Ainane is not exactly mad. It means mad in a silly. Ainane is nearer to silly. But yeah, it could. they could both mean mad. Very good. So Zany is mad. Uh, skittish is uh, anxious. So again, yeah, jumpy, edgy, or uh, anxious, worried. Uh, nervous, nervous. These are all uh, synonyms. Okay. Jinky is uh, actually a rare word. Jink, the word jink means full of curves. You know, okay. so if you say that uh, the the road up the hills was jinky, it means that the road, uh, the road up the hills was full of curves. So that could be the word. So I think curvy, uh, curvy, something like that. Okay. So chows to chows up something. So that's the only thing left that's stir up. To so chows up something, stir up something. Again, a very rare word. As you can see, my uh, 
my editor says it's a wrong word it says it's not a word in the dictionary but it is a rare word it means to stir up something yeah to to stir up something so yeah so c um c a c a uh, d b okay yeah very good so that's the right answer so even if you don't know i think jinky mezi is an adjective so you can make that even if you uh, skittish is uh, jumpy if you are or even if you don't do that if you see uh, the uh, uh, yeah i suppose you could say that uh, the only verb here is chows all the others are uh, adjectives so you can say that chows has to mean stir up so that's one uh, answer Zeni, I think you might know it's Maisie. I suppose you can work it out like that. You can sort of uh, work the options out. Very good. So you've done a very good job there. We'll uh, move on to the next question. There are just two questions. I'll just give you two minutes. Just quickly go through it. It's now 5.45, 5.47. We'll start uh, with these two questions. Okay, how about putting? Okay, uh, tentative. I think uh, is, is, it, it is. is my voice breaking? Yeah, sir, your voice is really uh, laggy. Sir, it's it's breaking. Okay. I'm the host, so I can't. Uh, is it better now? No. No, sir. No, sir. It's the same. Okay. Fine. 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 I'll uh, please give me a moment. I'll just. I think uh, I'm the host and this one co-host. Please give me a moment. Uh, could you please try to uh, solve the, the next question as well? Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please do that. Thank you.
Um, is it still back? Yes, sir, it's, this, it's still the same. Okay, fine. So I, I think I just make somebody the host. Let's see. Boom. I just make someone the host and see if I can.
I think the chat is disabled. Um, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, wait. No, but you can still chat with everyone, right? Um, I'm trying to type and it says chat disabled, so I'm not sure. Yeah, chat is disabled. You have to enable it. Okay, this is like that I'm trying. Yeah. Now? Yep. Now, it's yep, it's better. Okay. Mm, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Oh, thank God for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arya. Thank you. Okay, so, so one second. I'll just make you the. Yeah, course. please, please, please do that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So we'll, uh, okay. So. Right. So, uh, could you do that? Could you finish the? Uh, could you finish uh, yes. the next question as well? Yeah. Okay. So we'll just share screen and right. So. Right. So yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So the word tenere in uh, Latin means to hold. Or to make fin. So, what's the answer for that? So the um, sorry, sir, will it be tentacles? Tentacles. Okay. Um, fine. Because uh, to take the odd one out, that's why. Okay. How about tentative? Why not tentative? That is also a close one, sir. But I just went. You know, I went and guessed with tentacles rather than tentative. Okay, fine. I think tentacles is uh, fine. I think uh, I think that's okay. So, how about the next one? Uh, D. The allege. Would that be? I again went with B, so I went with love. Yeah, very good. Uh, because you see, uh, see, uh, the word law comes from the this Proto-Indo-European word called leg, right? So it means to lie down or to lay. So law initially meant to lie down. To lie down is not to, or to lay means, uh, meaning uh, to uh, sort of lay something down, to lay uh, dictum down or something like that. So, and also look at the words here. The kind of uh, love is the only odd man out. Law, league, allege. They all what's have something allege? to do. Yeah? What, what's the meaning of allege? Allege, yeah, thank you. Uh, allege is to uh, uh, sort of uh, blame someone uh, or to accuse someone without uh, accuse someone without uh, a lot of proof, without solid proof, maybe. Okay. Without solid proof. Yeah, 
that's what alleged means to it means to accuse yeah so the 14th one doesn't tentative mean not certain yes so why isn't that the answer uh, i think that between uh, tentative and tentacles i would not really know what to do i think that uh, this should have been uh, something else maybe uh, yeah i i don't see that uh, i don't see why tentative is not uh, because i i don't think that the etymology of tentative has anything to do with uh, with the with, 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 uh, with holding with the word tenere i think it should have been something like uh, tenuous yeah i think this is a wrong question it's not a very well framed question i think i just made a mistake while framing it maybe if it was tenuous now do you think it's tentacles yes. yeah not really sir now it, we are kind of leaning towards more now it's uh, uh, clearly tentacles so maybe it's my fault i i should have uh, tentative is not very obvious thank you for asking Uh, how about uh, the next question yeah see uh, stentorian means a voice like the greek herald stentor who was used to make public declarations so stentorian means having a loud voice so uh, the opposite of that would be fluting because that is a very soft voice very good fluting is whispering in a very uh, uh, in in a very shy way not being very confident a piercing voice strident is very confident right i think strident is also the name of a software company it means very very confident so are you all okay with that i think the answer is going to be fluting how about smitten smitten is to fall in love with someone that's the uh, the the original meaning but initially it meant to have been uh, to to get beaten up by someone you know so assail could also be uh, a meaning although assail literally means to attack someone but metaphorically it could also mean to uh, fall in love with someone repel could be a antonym uh, enamored again means to be in love with someone to be dotty about someone again is to be in love with someone so repel would be the right answer are you okay with that any doubts so a sale as you said literally means to beat up someone so how is a sale dotty and enamored in the same group a sale uh, uh see uh, i think as the words move uh, i think that in the uh, initial meaning uh, a sale was to uh, to attack someone uh, meaning to fall is something like cupid uh, you know hitting uh, sort of uh, shooting a bow on you that sort of a thing a sale was to um, uh even smitten see smitten uh it, it's only now it means uh, but initially it meant to to have been beaten by someone so it not just attacking someone physically but it's uh, i think initially it meant uh, to assail was also could, could have uh, had a tone like of love to it. someone's heart in a way like stealing their heart something so something that like that something like that yeah so but repel is quite uh, obviously the antonym even smitten means that smitten is actually very close to assail it is closer to assail than it is to dotty or enamored very good thank you so racy is crude racy remarks is suggestive yeah suggestive remarks or something like sexually suggestive remarks ribald uh, ribald again is uh, uh, to make vulgar jokes risk is not vulgar but it's uh, is uh, it's it's sexually subjective yeah it's subjective but, but it's suggestive but in a, in a in a kind of a fashionable way it's not very vulgar it's not ribald ribald and risk are different ingenuous what does ingenuous mean it means uh, very sincere very uh, it's sort of uh, it means uh, very uh, innocent very sincere so i think that would be the uh, ingenuous again comes from the word ingenuus in latin which means native salt of the earth that kind of thing very sincere what about brobding negian that would be colossal in size so lilliputian would be small yeah. out of all of them yeah very good see they are both from a novel uh they from a novel uh can you guess the novel gulliver's travel so lilliputian uh, lilliputs and Brobdig nags. They were both from. Um, uh, they both uh, 
species from this novel called Gulliver's Travel. Lilliputs were very small people and Brobdingnags were giants. So humongous is an American word which again means very large. Gargantuan again means like a gargantula. The gargantula is a kind of a beast, very large. Mickle again means very large. Although mickle uh, tends to sound like pickle, which might seem like very small, but it's not. It's mickle means very large. It's a rad word. So really put in is a very uh, appropriate. Okay, how about leisure domain? Leisure Sir, domain. I had yeah. one doubt in this question because uh, it was written literally light of hand, but doesn't that mean the sleight of hand? To be skilled. It could be yeah, very good. It could be light of hand or sleight of hand. Sleight of hand is a meaning. See, leisure domain. Uh, leisure literally means light. Okay. And de me means of hand. So this word literally in French means light of hand. But light of hand is a meaning. Okay. Light of hand means to be skilled. Very good. Yeah. So I think uh, so. Uh, adept means skill. Adroit means skill. Dexterous means skill. So inept is uh, uh, careless, not skilled. So very good. I think we'll go for that. So that's the right answer. So we'll wind up with this. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you got some doubt, you can always uh, come back to me and we'll close this and we'll probably move on to the, the next worksheet. Uh, that's uh, VA 36. And please do the first paragraph, try to uh, answer the first paragraph. I think it's a very hard question. The first question is very hard. Uh, the second and the third question are considerably easy. The first question is considerably harder than a typical uh, CLAT question, so don't be bogged down, be casual. So try to solve the first question and we'll get back uh, in maybe 10, it's now uh, in 12 minutes, it's now 6.8, we'll get back at 6.20. Just the first question. Just try to read the passage slowly. It's okay if you can't answer the questions.
Okay, have you all read the passage? It's okay if you uh, haven't started solving the questions or answering the questions. Have you read the passage? Yes, sir. Uh, does somebody want more time? Does somebody want more time or do we just uh, sort of continue? Okay, fine. So I think we'll continue. Okay. So what we'll do is because we have just 14 participants, we'll go from, we'll start with each, uh, with each person and we'll see if we can. Okay, how about Arya? It should be hard with having a name with two Esther? A's. Yeah, so uh, I think we'll start with you. We'll start with the first question. Yeah. Okay. But the first so, one I didn't do, I did the second one. Okay, that doesn't matter, we'll do it together. Okay. So from the passage, what can we infer most assertively uh, about uh, Republica Spruska? Okay, it was a multi-ethnic state before the Srebrenica uh, genocide. Mm, okay, it was formed only after the Srebrenica genocide. Okay, uh, it has always been xenophobic, none of the above. Okay, so I think that uh, from this part of the passage, see, they, um, okay, any answers for that question? Any guesses? How about Adia? What do you think the answer is? Okay, let's just uh, read some part of it. Okay, uh, and then let's see, uh, okay. Yeah, see, so the agreement, so this agreement, the, the Dayton Accords negotiated under the uh, aegis of the US in 1995, okay? So the agreement froze in place Milosevic's territorial gains and secured international recognition for Republica, Republica Spruska, even though its territory was not majority served before the war. So what we can infer from that is that Republika Spruska, uh, before the war, it was not majority Serb. Whereas now, after all the genocide, after all the, you know, this, we just mark that part of the passage, you know, after the, uh, they talk about uh, the massacre of, uh, you know, of the Bosnian Muslims, you know, which epitomized the brutality of the Serbs campaign of murder, uh, repression against Bosnian Muslims was an act of genocide. So, so after all of that, so after the 8,000 men and boys uh, at uh, Srebrenica were sort of killed, after all of that, it became a Serb majority. It is now a Serb majority, right? So we certainly can infer that, um, that, that, that it was a multi-ethnic state before the Srebrenica genocide. That can be inferred. So we have it in the pipeline. So therefore, none of the above is ruled out. So none of the above is ruled out. It has always been xenophobic. We don't know that. We know that it is, we know that it is now xenophobic. For example, uh, there's this, uh, this whole uh, uh, Shemnitz riot in 2018, which is anti-immigrant protests, etc. So we know that it is now xenophobic, but had it always been xenophobic, we don't know. We have no reason to say that it was always xenophobic. So we can roll C out. And I think that uh, A and B are very close options. See, uh, it was formed only after the Srebrenica genocide. Sir? Yeah. I think it's more B because we don't really know if it was completely multi-ethnic. Uh, multi we don't know whether there was, you know, any form of prejudice or xenophobia before. So, yeah, there is a possibility that it did exist before. But one thing that we are sure of is that yeah. it was formed only after, after the Srebrenica genocide. So. Very good. Yeah, I think so. 
that's a very good explanation so are we okay with that uh, uh, is uh, uh, how about aria do you think b is more suitable than a yeah okay so very good so the um, next question yeah so um but um a genocide wouldn't have occurred if it wasn't a multi ethnic state because yes. there was a genocide we can conclude that it was a multi ethnic state uh they haven't no. mentioned anything about a multi ethnic state so the what you do what they put a genocide is to uh, is for uh, is to ethnic clan right So yeah, it that is, implies that it's an ethnic, uh, multi-ethnic state. So maybe there were just two ethnicities, Serb and uh, the Muslims. So I mean, that's, if we have just two people, uh, we can't call it multi-ethnic. I mean, maybe uh, that's one thing. They have said something about the Muslims, so it might be A as well. Yeah, it, uh, A and B are very close. So we have to uh, because the genocide even happened in the first place. Something arose that feeling. You know what I mean? Of, xenophobia itself so saying that mm. it was multi ethnic uh, multi ethnic from the beginning states mm. that they were you know completely cool with everyone from the beginning but that's not the case as we see that after some time a genocide did occur so no, multi ethnic need not mean that it's uh, you are cool with your the other ethnic group. For, for example india is now a multi ethnic state but you can't say that we're cool with uh, all the other ethnicities so i think uh, b kind of encompasses a You see, yeah. if you say that uh, it was formed only after the Srebrenica genocide, you can kind of infer A from that. And like I said, A and B are both right. You can't say A is wrong. But if you were to go for one option, I think that uh, uh, B would be the most suitable option because it kind of encompasses A point one and point two. It that's the central argument of this whole passage. The whole idea that there was genocide, and after the genocide, see, they say here that. uh this whole Rep- republika srpska the serb majority political entity that has been carved out of bosnia so it has been carved out of bosnia so after the uh, the, the genocide had happened so i think that b would be kind of the most appropriate among the other options okay so the next participant to do we have ashita Is Ashita able to use uh, your microphone? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, Ashita. Yeah. So let's go. Let, let's try question two. Why does the offer say statues cause controversy? Okay. So why does the offer say that? So that's the beginning, right? They say statues cause controversy, and they say that in Banja Luka. the second largest city in bosnia um herzegovina uh, preparations are underway to creating and erecting of peter hanke and they say that peter hanke is a 2019 nobel laureate for literature and is a controversial figure he's, he's a controversial figure because he's a genocide apologist he's a fascism apologist and he denies the massacre of 8000 men and boys at uh, sabrenica in 1995 which epitomized the brutality of the serbs campaign of murder etc against bosnian muslims okay he denies that this was an act of genocide so and they say that to build uh, to erect his statue is um, is um, uh, a controversial act right so now let's go back and look at the options option a Uh, because statues are mostly built for people who have a popular yet controversial reputation like hanke who despite being an apologist of a genocide was awarded the nobel prize i think that's a very very suitable option we can't rule that out right after that so we'll have it in the pipeline yes, we'll move on yeah we'll move on to option b uh because statues are built only for the popular people rather than people uh, rather that should have been rather than i'm sorry rather than uh people who do the real work i think that's a bogus option i think the examiner is just trying to uh do you think that's bogus ashita is it's it not it's not sincere right yes sir no very good how about c statues are built mostly for members of the majority community of the state that possibly it is true but it's not as it's not as cutting as a i think a is uh, very suitable okay uh okay so statues are uh, built to remind people 
who are its locals, uh, who its locals, and who its foreign interlopers are. Mm, again, that's quite possible, but that's not the yeah. So why do you uh, strike out C? Uh, C is not wrong, but statues are built mostly for members of the majority community of the state. That is true, uh, and. Uh, uh, C and D, but I don't think that it's as, uh, I think A again, because A says that people who are popular and people who are popular are very often from the majority community, or at least they are uh, appeasing or they are in agreement with the majority community. Yeah. So A is kind of A encompasses C and A is kind of more suitable. So I think A is quite clearly the right answer here. Please, sir. We, yeah. So for B, um, yeah. I know you said that that was a bogus answer, but um, do you feel that it's somewhere an ugly truth? Uh, because statues are built only for pe popular people rather than people who do the real work. Yeah, I think that okay. is true. But in this case, I think this person won a Nobel Prize. So it isn't uh, completely like, you know, cutting out the aspect of people who really work for the state. Okay, sir. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Thank you. Okay, how about question three? Who's the next in line? Uh, so we have uh, Amit B. Do we have Amit? Yes, sir. Yeah, very good. Okay, so why does the author think Peter Hanke doesn't deserve a Nobel Prize? His literary output is, isn't worthwhile. Uh, that's wrong, right? Uh, I don't think that the author makes any comment about uh, Hanke's literary. Uh, I think I'm calling out names, but, but I'm not asking you for your option. I'm very sorry. So, uh, Amit, what do you think the answer could be? Uh, I think it's uh, D. D. Very good. So he was from a state that was the products of a genocide. Okay. So I don't think that's very suitable because just because you come from a state that was a product of a genocide doesn't mean that you should not be worthwhile. You should, uh, yeah. Not... Either D or B. Okay, very good. I think D or B. Okay, uh, D is wrong because just because you come from a state that was a product of a genocide doesn't mean that uh, you don't deserve a Nobel Prize. Okay. I mean, after all, it all comes down to your uh, your caliber and your literary output and your way of looking at the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that. Uh, he was an apologist of fascism seems to be the very suitable answer because how can you be an apologist of uh, fascism and genocide and still win uh, the world's most prestigious award for uh, literature and literature is supposed to be all about uh, uh, all about uh, encouraging humanity and humanness and all that so i think b is the most suitable answer are we all okay with that okay so we'll go on we'll move on to b Okay, who's the next participant here? Uh, Aniket Amarnath. Okay. Yes. Sir. So yeah. So why does the offer take the example of uh, Milorad uh, Dodik? Okay. So what's the answer? Uh, 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 you could take some time and probably try to solve it. Because Milorad Dodik is a genocide apologist. Okay. We can't rule that out. To illustrate the fact that genocide apologists still hold political offices. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, it's both A and B. Both A and B. Let's see. Uh, I, I think it's just B because the example, even though uh, this person, Milorad Dodik, is a genocide apologist, I don't think that his, his example is... Uh, sort of uh, mentioned here to illustrate that. See, they say here, see, they say that, and it's beyond comprehension that there are not only fanatics on the political fringes who deny this Srebrenica happened, but that some of these people hold political office. And then they give you the example of this person, Milorad Dodik, uh, and they say that they are, this person serves as the Serb member of Bosnia's uh, tripartite state level presidency, okay? And so the example of this person is, uh, A and B is very tempting. That's why it's given there. But his example is mentioned to uh, illustrate the fact that uh, some of these fanatics are not only on the, 
on the political fringes but they they also happen to hold uh, they also happen to hold or some political of these people, yeah some of the whole political office and an example of such a person is milorad dodik okay i think that's uh, a and b is given to confuse you i think that a more suitable answer would be b i think very good so i think that's a very good attempt but b is uh, a very suitable answer okay so we'll mark b and uh, excuse me sir yeah why is it that we've not considered d at all even though it's literally like i think copied from the passage let's see because he called for an annulment i mean he did that uh see he did do that so that's uh, a kind of a, that's very good yeah uh, see because he uh, okay because it's misspelled here okay uh, yeah i think that is something he did but i, I think that's more of a, a, a an ancillary uh, thing right it so happened that he statement than a literal reason is what you're saying yeah i think it's more of an ancillary he he just happened to uh, say something like this but i don't think that that's central to uh, the reason he is being mentioned see uh, he uh, very good like uh, ayan says see he this person says that uh, this person literally kind of made an annulment uh, of republica spriska's formal acknowledgement of the bosnian serb but that's not that's only a reason that's that's kind of uh, uh strengthens the argument that uh, fascist people are still holding political uh hold political office so i'm not very sure as to uh, whether that really uh, i think that b is more suitable very good i think it's nice that you mentioned d but i think b is uh, kind of more suitable than okay how about five uh, from the passage what can be inferred about the muslims of okay it should have been europe not european so we'll have the next participant uh, uh amit yeah ayan 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 sir yes sir ayan yes we have ayan very good okay so how about this so um they have already mentioned that they are not alien interlopers that's what they concluded at the end and yes they are an integral part of european history and i do not believe that much of c as they have been long prosecuted but they have been prosecuted for quite a while and i'm considering that a significant amount of time and so i want to go for d which is all of the above very good okay uh i think that's uh, that can be uh, inferred from uh, all that he said very good so they've uh, they say here that uh, these were not alien interlopers in our continent but an absolutely integral part of his history against whom we are ranged uh, the against whom we were ranged the very worst of forces so so what they say is that uh, we have been uh, persecuting them very good so i think that we can go for d have you all okay with that any doubts uh, any other options okay so i'm assuming that you're all okay thank you so the next uh, do we have dhruv kamlesh is dhruv uh, able to use yeah thank you thank you okay so why does the offer give us the example of uh, the 2018 riots in um, shemnitz yeah see imagine the separatist movement in say the german okay uh, era uh, so that's that's the that's the whole passage right we just mark that and we'll read that uh, okay uh, we'll read that and then we'll ask guru for his answer uh, imagine a separatist uh, uh, imagine a separatist uh, just give me a moment i think i'll just put my laptop on charge i'm sorry okay yeah so imagine a separatist movement in say german federal uh, state of saxony protesting that germany has been unreasonably laden with war guilt uh, ever since the nazi era okay in the city of chemnitz in 2018 riots uh, fomented by uh, what does foment mean foment is to stir up stir up some something but mostly evil sensation uh okay we'll come back to that we'll uh, okay maybe i'll write it down here ferment is to stir up to stir up uh, some kind of an emotion you could say that uh, to stir uh, you could say that the uh, the singer was able to ferment up 
extreme emotions in the audience, something like that. It means to stir up. Very good. Okay. So riots fomented by the far right gained world headlines. Okay. And anti-immigrant protests. Yeah. So so there were anti-immigrant protests here and they gained world headlines. So and he says, well, that's about where we are in Bosnia, where xenophobic lies have re-entered the political bloodstream through the Republika Spruska and its supporters. Okay, so that's what, that's the uh, context. So let's, uh, go back here and see. So why does the offer give us the example of the 2018 riots in uh, the city of Chemnitz, uh, to question whether Germans can simply absolve uh, their guilt over Nazi era. Hmm. Mm, I'm not, uh, uh, yeah, Dhruv, uh, do we have Dhruv? Yes, sir. Yeah, so what do you think about that option? Do you think that uh, it is not, it, it, we can't rule it out, but it's not, yes, it doesn't click somehow, right? Uh, okay, to illustrate the rising xenophobia of Eastern Europe. We don't even know if it's Eastern Europe. Of course, yeah. it is Eastern Europe, but uh, from the passage, we cannot really infer that it's Eastern Europe. But between A and B, do you think A is more suitable than B? But still, we'll have B in the pipeline. But do you it's, think that between A and B, A is more suitable than B? Because we don't yes. really know that Bosnia is in Eastern Europe, although it is. Okay. Yes. To illustrate the reintroduction of xenophobic lies into the political bloodstream of Bosnia through the Republika Spruska. So do you think that's more appropriate? Than... Is more appropriate, yes. Yeah? Yes. Do you think C is the right answer? Yes. Very good. Are you all okay with that? Okay, I'm assuming that you're all okay with that. So we'll have the next participant after Dhruv. Did you have Kirti Narendran? Oh, yes, sir. Okay, Kirti. So in the context in which it is used, what could the word, uh, what could be the nearest meaning of the word stymie? Let's see where stymie is used. It's, 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 it's. Um, I think I'll have to do a control F. Stymie, the other one. Yeah, see, they talk about stymie here. So that's where stymie is used. We'll just mark that. And we'll see the context in which it's used. Um, they say, naturally, his supporters in Serbia and West have promoted a preposterous conspiracy theory that he was murdered by something called the New World Order to stymie the brilliance of his defense. So stymie means something like to hide or to uh, to prevent or to undermine, right? See, they say that, uh, let me re re uh, read that once more. Naturally, his supporters in Serbia and the West have promoted a preposterous conspiracy theory that he was murdered by something called the new or world order to stymie his brilliance the brilliance of his defense. So stymie is uh, to undermine or to uh, sort of uh, blanket or to, to hamper, right? So we'll look at the meaning. Yeah, foil, what, what does foil mean? Prevent. Very, uh, very good, prevent or uh, it could mean to destroy the foils of war, right? Okay, very good. What does foster mean? something yeah foster parent to help something grow very good what is oh yeah, postpone it's not postpone we can mm, we can't between a and d i think a. we have to make a choice very good a excellent so i think a is uh, foil is nearer to the meaning very good okay so we'll have the next participant did we have my free girlfriend Is my free able to, uh, are you able to use a microphone? Okay. I don't think we have my free golf song, so we'll move to Meghna. Do we have Meghna?
Okay. Yes, uh, sir. Yeah, we have Megha. Very good. Okay. So we'll have eight. Okay. First, genocide is everybody's, everyone's business. So why does the offer make this statement? So the offer makes this statement here, right? So the offer says, uh, first, genocide is everyone's business. Okay. Yes, so what? Why does it, the the offer say first? You would say first, second, third, or finally, or fourthly. Only if, if you are if you already talked about something, right? So let's see what precedes that. See on this a quadrant centennial of that means the the twenty fourth twenty fifth year on this quadrant centennial of the worst atrocity on European soil since nineteen forty five. I hope that some lessons will be instilled in our political culture. So that's the whole thing. So he wants to instill some uh, something into a uh, into his or her political culture. Okay. So first genocide. Uh, is everyone's business. Okay, so we could think of it as that. Okay, so during Bosnia, during the uh, during the Bosnian war, especially in its early stages, the Western democracies did their utmost to avoid using the word genocide, lest it legally compel them under the terms of the 1948 UN Genocide Convention to intervene. So they didn't want to intervene. So the Western democracies did not want to intervene. And to avoid intervention, they they did not, they avoided the word genocide. Because if they use the word genocide, if they portray the war as a genocide, then according to the 1948 UN Genocide Convention, they would have had to intervene. Right? So, yeah. okay. So let's just go back now, Meghna, and we'll see if we are able to answer this question. So, because it literally, because it is literally stated uh, so uh, in the 1948 Genocide Convention. Uh, why does the offer make this statement? Uh, we can't rule that out, right? Yeah. Very good. So we'll have it in the pipeline. How about B? Can we rule that out to illustrate why the Western democracies must have opposed uh, the Srebrenica genocide? Can we rule that out? No, right? No. We can't rule that out either uh, as a lesson to be instilled in our political culture. We can't rule that out either. So it's okay. all of the above to varying extents. Very good. Yeah. Uh, are we all okay with that? Very good. So uh, do we have uh, anyone back uh, by any chance? Do we have uh, Maitri Gautam back? Okay, we'll move on. Do we have, do we have Pooja? Do we have Pooja by any chance? Or, okay. Um, right. Do we have Raghav Shankar? I think people have uh, an issue with their microphone. That's okay. Uh, Sanchit Kawale? Do we have Sanchit? Right. Uh, Sutej? Okay, we have Sanchit. Very good. I think Sanchit, we have Sanchit, right? Uh, okay, Sanchit, okay, fine. So why does the offer give us the example of uh, Nabosia Malik? Okay, I think we'll uh, leave it, we'll open it up to everyone because we have very little time now. We're supposed to close the session by uh, 7.20 because there was a, Ten minute delay to start. Are we okay with seven twenty? Does somebody have a class or anything like that? Is seven twenty okay? Um, am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. So I think some of us have left. Some of us. Uh, okay. So what's the answer to question number nine? Why does the offer give us the example of Nabosia? Uh, Naboisa Malik. Because he went from being a blogger to a senior writer merely from being a genocide apologist, right? That's the answer, right? See, we can infer that from this passage, this part of the passage. See, they talk about, uh, secondly, denialism of genocide and uh, and war crimes isn't merely and, and, and all that. See, for example, uh, yeah. 
so they say that uh, the 20th an uh, anniversary of uh, srebrenica uh, it published a piece by an obscure blogger who now became a senior writer for the rt rt is a uh, russian today are uh, called uh, naboisa malik srebrenica okay so who claimed that most propaganda about uh, uh, the bosnian war relied on allegations of uh, serb aggression and genocide so he called the whole thing a bluff right so from that part of the passage we can infer that uh, c is the right answer any doubts see he is a famous blogger but that he is not a famous blogger at all right he was an obscure blogger obscure meaning he was not very famous so we'll move on to the next question why does the offer make the statement diplomacy has a limit and a role like i told you this is a very hard passage the next passage will be considerably simpler so the idea is to prepare you to for something much harder so that in the real examination you are able to uh, very quickly get all the answers right right see third third it should, it should have been thirdly secondly firstly like it's finally but it's a mistake a good editor would have corrected it but okay never mind so thirdly diplomacy has a limit as well as a role it's commonly thought even now that the serb campaign of aggression against constitutional multi ethnic state of bosnia came to an end with the dayton uh, accords negotiated under the aegis what is under the aegis mean under the intervention or under the supervision of the us in 1955 that is not correct so when we say diplomacy has a has a limit and a role it means that's not correct so the uh, the diplomacy of europe it was not perfectly it, it was not very effective okay so the agreement it in fact it had adverse effects because the agreement froze in place uh, this person uh, milosevic's territorial gain and secured international recognition for the republika pruska even though its territory was not majority serb before the war we are now facing predictably con predictable consequences of being too soft on milosevic okay let's go back and see what an answer could be okay because uh, diplomacy can, cannot solve all problems okay we can't rule that out but somehow it doesn't click it seems to be very shallow let's go on to b uh, as an example to illustrate why the uh, why the us uh, intervention at the bosnia war was ineffective i think this is more suitable than a we'll have it in the pipeline between a and b i would go for b c as an example to illustrate that a genocidal regime doesn't have limited ambitions hmm i'm not very sure about that what that got to do with diplomacy we can rule c out i think and to illustrate that muslims aren't interlopers uh, in bosnia again we can rule that out i think we can rule d out as well so i think that the most effective answer is going to be b are you okay with that okay so now quickly go to the next question uh, it's a very simple passage uh, i think you can do it in 5 minutes it's now 655 i think we'll resume at 7 uh, it's a very simple passage and it's a very very easy question compared to uh, the last question Are you are we all okay with the last passage? No doubts, right? Any doubts? Okay.
Okay, have you all read the passage? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's a very simple passage, I think, this one. Yes, sir. Uh, so we'll uh, start with the first question. Uh, okay. So what can you say about the tone of the offer across the passage? Sir, I would say factual. analytical or factual. Analytical or factual. Uh, don't you think it's accusatory? Um, it is, sir, but he is stating so many facts as to why um, Kerala is, you know, wrong over here. And so I feel it's more factual than him straight out without giving any reason saying that um, Kerala is uh, being hypocritical. So See, I think that uh, that's good. But I think that the central argument here is that Kerala had uh, apparently filed a Supreme Court case on Karnataka for sealing its borders. But now it was doing exactly the same thing. So don't, don't you think that at every passage, don't you think that... Uh, uh, see, they uh, that they talk about because factual. They aren't kind of providing with any facts. They're only talking about the condition of people. So it is kind of descriptive. They're not talking about how many people have been. Okay, there are some facts. For example, uh, they say twenty-eight days here. Facts are when it's kind of full of information. Uh, see, here it's all about. It's mostly about. Uh, they are kind of ac accusing the government. They are accusing Kerala. For example, they say that, uh, you know, uh, to prevent the spread of virus. So they, they quote the health minister and this rule shall be applicable uh, to doctors as well. And then they quote, they tell you, um, an infringement to the right of life and freedom of movement. Uh, all these arguments uh, seem to not hold any value for the state, which ironically is barring its own citizens from entering the district. So you can say that this person doesn't really like Kerala. You know, this person has yeah, some problem. Kind of his opinion then, if you're putting it that way. Mm, mm. This person, see, so the hypocrisy on the part of the Kerala, see, that's a, that's a very strong statement, right? This hypocrisy on the part of the Kerala government is being called out by locals who have uh, had to uh, initially fight for facilitating treatment in their own town or to be able to earn their living uh, across the border. So factual is if they are providing you with facts and they are allowing you to make the, make the uh, interpretations for yourself. So when yeah. he's, this hypocrisy on the part of Kerala government is being called out by locals, isn't he saying that the locals themselves are saying that Kerala is being hypocritical, if I'm right? Mm, see, he's saying that, but uh, who are the locals and what percentage of locals? Uh, okay, okay, fine. Yeah. See, yeah, yeah, I get your point, sir. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it could be kind of uh, maligned, right? The whole thing could have been maligned. And... What do you mean when you say local? So uh, factual is when, for example, you are presenting the uh, the, the reader with uh, a set of facts, and you are uh, uh, and you let the reader form his or her opinion about what you are trying to say. You don't interfere. You don't say things like it's hypocrisy and locals are calling it a uh, hypocrite, uh, calling it mad, and all that. So it's only when you're unbiased that we get to choose. Yeah, exactly. It's unbiased. Whereas here they say things like uh, you know returning favor and things like that. So I would say that the writer doesn't really like Kerala. They have some kind of a problem with the state. Okay, so consider the line, but the current announcement bars the return of those heading to the neighboring district for work and had left citizens in border areas at Kasargod in distraught. Who is in distraught? So but I think it's B. Citizens of the border areas of Kerala, especially Kasaragod. Very, Very good. Okay. The citizens, yeah, I think that uh, it's quite clear, right? Yeah. It's quite straight, straightforward. Very good. So I think that the, yeah, okay, fine. So we'll move on to the next question because we, we really have to do the last passage too because it's a very important passage. Okay, what is, a, what is the raison d'etre of the passage? See, uh, raison d'etre means the central motive. Right, the, the principal motive. That's what uh, raison d'etre means. 
So what is our central motive? The Kerala government is not allowing uh, for the pre free movement uh, in and out of its border in the pretext of the pandemic. Okay, we have the pipeline. We can't pull it out. But... A or C, sir? Yeah, A or C. A or C. Okay, very good. We'll have it. We'll have A in the pipeline. The Karnataka government, though it had banned free movement at its borders, uh, had issued e passes for. Okay, that is certainly not the yes on that. Uh, the Kerala had taken uh, the Karnataka government to the Supreme Court for banning border movement, but had itself banned, but has itself banned movement now. Okay, so between A and C, if, if you had to sort of, uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, fix on one answer, what would your answer be? I'm leaning a bit to A only because it's proven time and time again about how he brings up Kerala being hypocritical. Like he keeps mentioning that again. Okay. And again, and again so. So I think that. Uh, see, Points to I think, C. Okay, very good. I think it's C because the. Because first of all, it, 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 it's, it's all about Kerala and Karnataka primarily. And it's also the fact that Kerala, few few months back, Kerala had uh, sort of castigated against uh, Karnataka for not letting uh, people into its state. And now it was doing the same thing that it that it had itself opposed a few weeks back. So what sense does that make? How can you go against your own uh, policy? That sort of thing. I think C between A and C. I think C is slightly more appropriate okay it doesn't matter uh, what could be a suitable title for the passage okay so again you must take the tone into consideration uh, kerala gives karnataka a taste of its own medicine so um i think between b and c the appropriate one would, would be, be b very would good be However, B sounds really savage, so I don't know whether we get to choose it, but I would choose B like naturally, but uh, what Very do you good. think is um, more appropriate in the sense of not like, you know, rubbing it in their face? Yeah. Okay. Okay, fine. So I think Kerala gives Karnataka a taste of its own medicine is wrong because that would mean that Karnataka, uh, because the, the writer has nothing to do with Karnataka at all. So I think A is wrong. God's own country runs un turns ungodly for its own citizens. I think uh, uh, that can't be ruled out. Although, yeah, like you said, it's a bit, a bit harsh. But I, I don't think that this writer really likes Kerala for some reason. Kerala blocks its border to its own citizens. That, that's a very unbiased kind of a title. Very good. So Kerala blocks its border to all aliens, including its own citizens who have been moving to other states. Again, that's very unbiased. So I think that B is... Uh, it, it kind of goes with the tone of the passage. Yeah, sir. Very good. Okay. So this, okay, fine. So let's move on to the last passage and we'll quickly do it. It's a very uh, interesting and a very short passage. So it's now uh, 7, 8. I think at 7, 13, we'll stop. We'll just take five minutes and quickly do it. Just try and see if you can read the passage. That's okay. We'll we'll get into the questions later.
Excuse me, sir. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So I had a question in the CLAT exam, usually in my ISC exams, what they do is if you were to give, you know, a, a meaning similar to another thing in a passage, they do mention it's in line six or make a sentence. Um, yes. Yes. Sometimes I think that in, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. I think that in CLAT sometimes they, they uh, embolden the words if they want a meaning. So they don't specifically say this para or this line. We're supposed I to do a relatively large thing and figure it out by ourselves. No, I don't think so. I think sometimes what they do is they, they kind of embolden the words. Okay, sir. I think they do that sometimes. I'm, uh, that, that's what I feel. I think that they, that they embolden the words. I don't think that they, but sometimes they don't do that. Sometimes they just leave it to you. I mean, the whole thing is ad hoc here. Okay, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Sure. Okay, so uh, have you all read the passage? Uh, yes, sir. Does, does somebody want more time? Uh, have you read the passage? It's okay if you haven't sort of answered the question, but have you read the passage? Okay, I think we'll just give, give, give the class one more minute. Okay, now, now uh, have you all read the passage? Uh, do we move on to the questions? Okay, fine. So uh, how about the first question? Which of the following statement is the offer of the passage least likely to agree with? How about option A? Not really, sir. It sounds most likely to. Yeah. Kinetic music is able to accommodate love in its myriad forms. From the... Very good. Okay. How about Padams and Javri are written mostly in Telugu? How about that? I'm not too sure, sir. I'm she, feeling she, it's more D or B. Okay. So it might be D. No, which of the following is the passage least likely least to likely agree to? to? Yeah. yeah so, B. Okay, we have. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure though. Okay. Uh, see, uh, least likely. So, do you think that the 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 author uh, the author would agree to the fact that Padams and Javalis are mostly written in Telugu. Yeah, he does. She she says here that uh, they're written in vernacular languages, but not necessarily Telugu. Um, he uh, he or she is uh, I don't know one place it did mention something regarding Telugu. So yeah. Hmm. See, I think that they talk about a few uh, padams which are in Telugu. Yeah, so okay. that, that doesn't mean that all the padams are in Telugu. She, she, she says towards the end that um, our lives will be richer uh, when we appreciate Shingara in all its nuances, starting with these classical love poems in vernacular. So vernacular languages are mostly uh, South Indian languages like Telugu. It could be Tamil, Kannada. 
it could be uh, see so padam uh, yeah. javlis are mostly poems that are set to music that are somewhat more uh, uh, explicit that uh, towards love rather than towards devotion so that's what makes them different from a typical a uh, carnatic music composition so that's the meaning of it so i think i'm not very sure about this but we'll have it in the pipeline okay so geetha is a banter between two lovers i think she says that uh somewhere here um yeah geetha govinda mirrors the dilemma of drama or of love affairs so the couplet are uh, sort of uh, grouped into verses referred to as ashtapadis or eight steps uh, are a banter between the two lovers often moving from the playful to the passionate so i think she is uh, going to accept that too let's move on to d mukta and brinda popularized padams and javalis breaking many type i think that's explicitly mentioned here see they say that uh, uh, it was a carnatic vocalist sisters mukta and brinda who spearheaded the mid 20th century movement to bring padams and javalis into the concert repertoire breaking many a taboo so so b sir yeah so i think b is the most suitable answer even if you were to eliminate between the answer options here i think b would be uh, the most suitable answer okay so 16 from the passage uh, what can you say about the primary difference between a padam and a javali okay so i think uh, the only place where she talks she says somewhere here that uh, yeah a javali is a bit more risk risk a you see uh is a bit more risk a what does risk a mean is it maybe a little bit more uh, festive so it will be c hmm, very good let's see um i think she says somewhere here too that javalis are a little bit more explicit um let's see i think the word used is explicit but uh, padam jan javalis yeah the uh, let's see okay she said there's more risk and let just see if you can control f and find explicit yeah see uh, javalis see what is less evident is that is how common padams and javalis so javalis are even more explicit poems so padams are explicit poem but javalis are more explicit than poem so that's what we're looking for let's look at the options uh, javalis are mostly written in vernacular languages whereas padam that's absurd uh, javalis are more devotional wrong javalis very good so are more explicit and sprightly risque means sprightly fast high in tempo that sort of thing right so padams embody shringara rasa that's wrong very good okay 17 uh, in the context in which uh, they are used what do the word risque and de rigueur mean it's a sir because risque refers to sexually suggestive and de rigueur refers to required okay very good are you all okay with that are we all able to sort of identify de rigueur see she, she she says your padam and javalis are uh, dirigar and bharatanatyam and other classical dance forms uh, dirigar means uh, it literally means strictly mandated by fashion by rigor or by strictly required that's what it means uh, something without which you can't do you really require it so are we all okay with that any doubts okay fine so uh, which of the following uh, may not be in folk on the passage okay so bharatanatyam dancers are not as shy as carnatic singers that can be inferred right see uh, she says here that uh, padam sanjavri is a dirigar in bharatanatyam and other classical dance from south, south of india the transition uh, even then she says etc see the transition of these ancient dance forms from temples to mainstream society occurred in the mid early to mid 20th century even then carnatic musicians shied away from presenting these songs in performances due to the explicit nature of their lyrics so from this part of the passage we can infer that uh, 
uh, it's quite possible that Bharatanatyam dancers are not as shy as Carnatic singer. So that can be inferred. So that is wrong. Traditional uh, uh, Indian arts embody a wide spectrum of uh, definition of love. That can be inferred, obviously. She says that the sensual and the devotional, so that, that is wrong. As Javali's, yeah. Okay, so Javali is out of a considerably faster tempo. I think she says that. She literally says that somewhere, so that's wrong. The so the purpose, time. yeah, very good. So the purpose of all Indian art is to unite devotion and love. That is not explicitly mentioned here. Only a few Indian arts, sir. Yeah, it's not mentioned here. They don't talk about the un uh, about the unison of devotion and love. They say that the devotion and love exist separately, but they don't talk about uh, how the Indian arts are able to unite the two. I think these uh, suitable answer. Okay, uh, uh, in in the third passage, when the writer says it might behoove us to become familiar with our own traditions. What does she mean? I think it's um, B, sir. Because okay. everyone believes like everything is very orthodox here, but she goes to show that Padams and Javelis um, uh, will say otherwise. Yeah, very good. Okay. So I think that is the right answer. I think uh, unless we should stop making disapproving comments about yeah, very good. I think that is the right answer. But yeah, I, and for the exact reason that he uh, that uh, Ayan mentioned, because uh, uh, we tend to think of ourselves as very orthodox people who, uh, but whereas uh, that's not the case. Uh, yeah, so this whole idea of the third, yeah, that's the thing, right? So, so we are very orthodox, and on YouTube and in Sabas, we talk about how. Uh, but, but whereas, uh, what does Bihu mean? Bihu means something that we'd rather do. It would do good for us to do it. We might as well do it. Very good. So uh, why does the author cite the line, Yevade Vard Evade, who is he? Why does he do that? Why does she do that? Okay, to illustrate the fact that our classical traditions are not tepid, but rather sensually charged. Hmm. I don't know. We'll have it in the pipeline. Yes. Uh, we'll move on to B. To illustrate the fact that Gopala was the primary deity of the poet's village. I think that's absurd. It's got nothing to do with that. Uh, okay. I think the writer is trying to say uh, that, it's, see, the, the writer is trying to uh, capture your, your attention. So they're, they're trying to say that uh, classical music is not just some boring stuff. It's about uh, contemporary emotions. It's all about a woman and the lover. Uh, the woman is married, the tryst are happening in broad daylight, etc. So I think that the writer is trying to capture your, your attention. So I think that A is more suitable. It's not B to illustrate the fact that Telugu poet, uh, that there was a Telugu poet even, I think that's absurd again. So uh, it's either A or D, sir. Okay. To show that classical music, especially the Carnatic, is steeped in the devotional. And okay, so between A and D, what would you choose? Um, a. A. Okay. I think A is uh, more suitable. I think I would go with A too. Are you all okay with that? Any doubts with this passage? I think we really uh, sort of uh, shot up. Uh, okay. So we'll stop here. And if you got any doubt, you please ask me. And please try to maintain a notebook and start making a list of words as and when you encounter them. If you don't do that, there won't be any growth. So I wish you all the best and uh, goodbye until the next class. All the best. Good evening, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good evening. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you. All the best. Thank, Thank you, sir. you, sir. Thank you so much. All the best.